So today uh, we're at the JOLT conference in Tsukuba in Japan and uh, I'm joined by Claire Crunch who gave us a great plenary this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Um, so first of all, could I ask you a little bit about your, your background? You started off um, studying German, right? Right. Mm. I, as you know, I'm from France. Mm. And so um, when I got to be 12 or 13, I had to choose a first foreign language. Mm. And then there would be a second foreign language that you'd take uh, when you're 15. So you take your first foreign language, and in those days and still today, you had the choice between English and German. Mm -hmm. And because my mother came from England and was English, my father said, don't take English. Anyway, English did not, in those days, I'm talking now about uh, the late 40s, mm -hmm. um, even after the war, uh, English was not, uh, didn't have the prestige that German had. Mm. German was the, uh, considered the prestige language for academic, anybody with academic ambitions. It was still viewed as the language of science, the language of uh, technology, the language of music, the arts, philosophy, and all this. And so I took German. I was not particularly good in German. Um, I had not very good teachers. And I didn't like German particularly, but I did like philosophy, and I wanted to study philosophy. But then I'm the eldest of seven children, and you can't make a living on, seven, on, on philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I thought that by uh, deciding to study then German language and literature at the Sorbonne in Paris, um, I could uh, also have an access then to uh, philosoph uh, philosophy in the original. And so I decided to specialize in German. Uh, and was destined, in fact, was trained to become um, a professor at a, at a French university or to teach in the upper grades at the, at the secondary school. Uh, and then uh, to, um, to perfect my German, I went and spent one year on a scholarship from the German Exchange Service in Munich. And that's where I met my future husband, who did not know any French, was not interested in France, but I was interested in Germany, so we uh, spent a few months in Germany before then he decided to emigrate to the States, um, and that's then how and, I got. And then he had to change of direction somewhat. And then um, when we landed in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, I already had one child, I was pregnant with the second, uh, there was no way I could have a career, but I did want to work and and, and get out of the house, so I, uh, there was a job opening at MIT for teaching French and German. And I asked them after a while not to teach French, I didn't like teaching my mother tongue. So I taught German for many, many years, and it's in the process of teaching German now no longer to French people but to Americans that I suddenly realized I didn't understand the Americans, I didn't understand my students, they didn't understand me as a French person teaching German. Um, and so I was in search of, I had all kinds of questions that arose directly out of my classroom experience. And then I started reading everything I could put my hands on in discourse analysis, in pragmatics, and in linguistics since I had not had a, a training in linguistics. And that really made me discover the field that was, uh, that was the beginning of the 70s. So it was the beginning also of applied linguistics in the U.S. and I grew with the field basically. Well, that, that so. we'll cut a lot out, but that brings us kind of up to today's plenary, really, which is uh, you were talking about um, language and, and borders, and yes. very yeah, really interesting um, the different kind of borders that we have. Um, and I, I, one phrase. I like very much was that borders define who we are and they distinguish us from others, um, but they also can constrain us. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how globalization is affecting uh, language learning and language teaching, in your opinion? Yes, globalization um, prides itself in erasing borders, mostly economic borders. Mm -hmm borders that impede uh, or put obstacles to uh, the free flow of goods, capital, people, etc. So anything that impedes travel, for instance, of people or the exchange of ideas or exchange of knowledge, um, globalization considers that as an impediment 
and, um, and tries to eliminate them. Uh, the computer, uh, through the network, the social networks, or by uh, linking computers to one another, has also eliminated sort of geographical borders, historical borders, um, and so it gives the illusion that uh, we are now ubiquitous, we can be at the same place uh, at the same time, um, and so it, we live in a world where um, everything is accessible to everybody, and in addition, where people think that the main obstacle to uh, intercultural communication or for us to be in a peaceful, harmonious world is access. And as long as we have access to one another and to all these goods, then everything will be solved. I uh, feel that the more people speak the same language, English as a lingua franca, the more we can travel, the more we can get to know people, the more access we have to all kinds of knowledge on the internet, etc., the more difficult it becomes to uh, to have a real understanding of one another, and the more fragmented we are and isolated we are, which is the paradox of globalization. Mm -hmm. Because the, the greater access we have, the, il the illusion of understanding one another, because we, don't, we, we seem to assume that we are all then accessible to one another, in fact negates the deep uh, roots in history that each one of us has and that is unique to each of us. Um, I think that kind of leads to um, the communication. We were talking, you were talking about communication and uh, the emphasis which some people are placing on communication, but communication for what or communication about what? Um, and technology is, has enabled us to communicate more freely, but with perhaps little substance. Um, I got the sense you were a little sceptical perhaps about uh, the idea that our main focus should be kind of communicative ability in language learning. Well, the, the emphasis on communication, uh, especially in our field in applied linguistics with the communicative language teaching, was in, we should not forget, was in reaction to the grammar translation method that put us into contact with uh, works from the past, literature works uh, uh, through translation into and from the foreign language, etc., and uh, totally ignored that they were language that languages were actually spoken by people, and that uh, we should uh, be learning foreign languages in order to be able to speak with living speakers of the language, which was not the case before World War II. Um, I think that uh, the invention of the language lab, say, uh, just before, or just uh, at the end of World War II, uh, was an effort by uh, GIs coming back from the field and having spoken with native speakers and realizing that we should be teaching languages in order to speak and not just to translate. So that was fine. It was a radical... But now there is no problem in speaking with people. It's just that we suddenly realize we speak to them we speak generally to them, or we post things on their wa the wall of their Facebook, but we don't necessarily understand them. Now, what do we mean by understand? Communicative language teaching has gone all the way from interpreting literary text to chit-chatting in uh, cocktail-style interactions with people. And that's fine, but... Um, uh, you get in very quickly into miscommunication or into a lack of uh, understanding um, that young people nowadays shy away from. So they shy away from uh, deep metaphysical trying to find out what we all, what we, uh, what we really value or what we believe in. Uh, avoiding divisive topics. So if we, if we avoid confrontation and divisive topics, of course we will never find out what divides us. Uh, we will live in this illusion that we are basically all the same and all we need is uh, to have each other's vocabulary and then we'll understand each other with no difficulty. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah, the, the kind of second half of your plenary today you were um, giving us some interesting examples of interaction between German and American uh, young students 
using uh, Kultura, is that right? Kultura. Kultura, um, which is kind of telecollaboration. Uh, it's an online, Kultura is an online um, uh, interactive um, but asynchronous interactive program to share um, cultural understanding mm -hmm. of your your own culture in interaction with another. Mm -hmm. And culture yeah. is the emphasis rather than language, although both are served. Both are, both are. Uh, so, for example, um, you would um, you would compare one of the activities would be to compare words that seem uh, to represent the same thing. Say, for instance, uh, the word teacher, mm. the word enseignant in French, the word lehrer in German. That from the dictionary all mean teacher. But the, the term teacher in English has a different value from the term lehrer in German. A totally different societal social value. A uh, teacher in English uh, is not a very prestigious profession. It's badly paid, uh, and it's the bottom of the ladder. Uh, Lehrer in German traditionally has a much higher societal prestige and is much better paid and much better uh, job security than, uh, than teacher in English. And so by comparing, so for instance, uh, one of the activities is uh, fill in the dots. A good teacher is, etc. Or uh, a good neighbor is, dot, dot, dot. And you have these sentences in French and German, etc. And uh, by, by asking the, uh, the people from various national cultures to fill in these uh, half-finished sentences, you will get an insight into the values of their society. Uh, respective to a neighbor or a friend, or a friend is not the same thing as un ami in French, or a friend in German. Would these usually these exchanges usually be conducted in uh, English or all of the languages? In all of or? the languages. Okay. Yes. So you would have Americans learning French uh, in conversation with native speakers of French, uh, speaking French. Who might uh, now? I forget whether there's. Uh, I, I think, yes. The purpose is to to have learners of French converse with uh, with native speakers of French in French, mm. and then uh, they, them doing the same thing in English. Yeah, yeah. So yes. kind of language exchange yes, in a very like tandem. simplistic exactly. kind of tandem. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there are there are a number of different kind of projects and uh, around this telecollaboration basic idea. Right. Kultura is one of them. Um, so you also talked about um, modernity and, and the teaching, the language teaching profession as, as still being, um, I suppose you could say to some degree, a little bit old-fashioned, a view of, of language which is not necessarily accurate. And you talked about things like order versus disorder, um, authenticity and purity versus a kind of hybridity. Um, can you develop that a little bit for me? I was, teach I was speaking, of course, from the perspective of a foreign language teacher, of a non-English language teacher. Mm. I don't teach English, I teach German. Mm. So um, these languages, and I, English is really a, a separate case, mm. because English is a, is a global language mm. uh, with not any particular cultural attachment to any particular national culture. But those languages like French, German, I'm, I, I would venture to say all the other languages of the globe, do have attachments to particular national or regional or ethnic uh, group memberships uh, that are very proud of that language. And so, um, all of a sudden I've got a blank. Can you... Can you so, uh, well, the, the, the goal is, for, especially for, for English, let's say, that... Um, there is a norm, there's a native speaker norm that we aim yes, at. Yes, yes. That we shouldn't have code right. switching. That right, so it's much wrong. easier for, uh, for teachers of English mm -hmm. to talk about hybridity and code switching and translanguaging and, and code meshing like Kanagaraja does than it is for the teachers of other languages. Uh, if, like for the French, if uh, your language, your national language is part of your national treasure and national language, you're less uh, prone or less disposed to, um, to praising hybridity and, uh, and 
all that, which is why I use the word modern, um, because uh, post-modernity or post-structuralism, etc., tries to get out of that national kind of, um, uh, those national boundaries. Hmm. Well, I suppose if we look at things like the British Council, for example, yes. um, they, they maybe have a different perspective than uh, is it the, the French uh, Academy Francais yes, and the right. German uh, Goethe Institute. Is the it? Deutsche Institute yeah. or, or, or Goethe Institute. Yeah. Right, although... I mean, they're all trying to export soft power to a degree, I suppose. Exactly, exactly. So is the, so the British Council mm. sells soft power, mm. but it does sell British English. I mean, it mm. sells, you know, speak British, buy British products. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th th there's a fine line, but I think uh, the British Council can afford to sell also you know, a, a universal ownership of English mm -hmm. because of the power of Oxford University Press, mm -hmm. Cambridge University Press, and the British market. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the French don't go for hybridity at all. But French is uh, also an international language, right? I mean, exactly. there's large swathes of Africa, parts of Asia speak exactly. French. And, but, yes, but francophonie, la Franco which is mm. la francophonie, mm. doesn't go in for code switching and code meshing mm. and all this. Yeah. I mean, uh, until very recently, they, they are starting to admit varieties of French, mm. like Senegalese French mm. or etc. But uh, they are not ready to, um, how could I say, to relativize the power of the Académie Française. Mm -hmm. oh, so no. There's, no, there's no room for a French as a lingua franca just yet? Lingua franca, well, the standard French as a lingua franca. Mm, but, not, but, but, not, but not as a variety. Not what, what you call in English lingua franca, yeah, no. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, do you see that changing in the future? Do you think this is something that, that uh, teachers of other languages, as, as apart from English or as well as English, need to address? This, uh... They need to address, but I think the English-speaking world should also realize the threat, the threat, the enormous threat that English poses for, for these other languages. Mm. Because the minute you open the door for, um, for German mixed with English, mm. French mi mixed with English, mm. Considering the power, symbolic power of English in the world, mm. English won't just mix, it'll, it'll take over. Mm. And so you have de definitely the feeling with the French that they are under siege. Mm. And they have to protect the French language against too much incursion from English. Mm. The Germans don't seem to be uh, as uh, concerned as the French are. They've never been which is why you can go to Germany and sometimes I have the feeling the Germans don't, don't uh, value their own language that much. That has been traditionally maybe their strength, or the, I don't know, depending on, uh, on how you see it. Well, far more Germans speak English than French speak English, I believe, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Mm. That has to do with cultural traditions and history, of course. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a couple of phrases to, to kind of sum up. There, there were a lot of uh, things that I noted that, that really appealed. Um, I like that you talked about the space between languages. That's what we need to, to, um, to understand. Can you enlarge on that? What did you mean by the spaces between languages? Well, this is the phrase that comes from that uh, report from the Modern Language Association that was trying to capture what the goal of the major of the, of the course of studies on the undergraduate level should be, mm. namely not the total mastery of one standard language, like French or German, mm. but the ability to operate between languages. Now that was a metaphor that was coined by this committee on which mm. I serve. Uh, it's everybody's guess as to how it can be operationalized. Mm. But definitely there was a, um, a, an intention to bring back translation and compa comparison between languages uh, that uh, was eliminated with the communicative approach. Uh, so bring back more reflexivity, mm -hmm. more uh, comment on the more metalinguistic uh, reflection in the classroom. Mm -hmm. 
this is how Germans do it, this is how English speakers do it. This is the value of this metaphor in French that does not translate directly into English. But So operating between languages would be uh, understanding um, the variations uh, when you do code switch what would be the additional meaning of it? And my favorite example is when I come back home to France, my sister, with one of my sisters with whom we always speak French, all of a sudden she says, oh no, no, c'est too much. <laughs> And I said, what do you mean, c'est too much? And she says, well, you're the American, you should know. And I say, I know what too much is, I don't know what too much is. And she says, well, it, you know, I don't want to sound like you Americans. So, but I know English. And she wants to so show that she's, she knows English, but she doesn't want to be taken for a Brit or an American. So she will say it. It's sort of showing that she's progressive and she knows English. So th these ads, layers of... Uh, of meaning that are not that don't exist if you take the, the, the pure language in the monolingual state. I see that that's very interesting. I mean, there's, there's some of the research into English as lingua franca shows that people like to retain a semblance of an accent because it's part of their identity, that's even right. though they're speaking English, right? That's right. Um, so I'm guessing that on a more simplistic level is that if you were teaching a class tomorrow, um, you would certainly not stick to the target language only. No, no, but I am sensitive to the argument mm. that um, switching too much back into English uh, sort of disrupts the, 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 the total immersion bath that you want the students mm. to experience. Mm. But I, feel, I have always felt that there's more possibilities of using both languages or, or multiple languages than mm. we think. For instance, you can speak exclusively the foreign language, but you can write on the board in the mother tongue. So they hear only German, but then instead of uh, crawling on the floor to show what a snake is, you can, you can write, uh, you know, snake on the board. Or you can have, like the Europeans do, you can, uh, in a presentation, you can speak in one language, which is what I do. So I speak in French when I'm in France, I give my presentation in French, my PowerPoint is in English, and my handout is in German. Well, you're fortunate that you can do that, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, that's yeah, what multilingualism right? is. Yeah. That's and what the, the globalized world is. And, and being here in Japan, I think sometimes we forget that it's probably the norm to be multilingual in Absolutely. many parts of the world, if not most of the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And I always, I always, since I'm now president of ILA, and I, I see in these congresses, ILA used to be French and English. Now they've dropped French. Because even the French come to Brisbane mm. like last, uh, last August and present in English. Mm. Why not speak in French to hear that beautiful language mm -hmm. with the PowerPoint in English? Mm. And, 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 and then the handout also in English. But mm -hmm. there are multimodal ways of, of operating between languages. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that takes us kind of to, to one of your closing points and another phrase I liked was that uh, the borders between languages or between whatever are uh, re-signified from lines to be crossed to lines to be engaged with, explored and reinterpreted. And yes. I suppose that's an example of, of exactly. that. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And never losing the opportunity every now and then in the classroom. It doesn't mean changing your syllabus or changing your lesson plan, but never lose an opportunity to say, ah, look, there's the difference, or point out and, and, and discuss the difference. Okay, well, that's a great note to finish. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you.